I think it does us a great disservice to see videos or watch videos or listen to podcasts or read books that try to sell us this idea that we too can go from this attachment style to secure forever and always. As someone who has truly nerded out and read so much research around attachment theory, and I know it's not a perfect theory like everything else in psychology and the world, the general idea of the childhood that you're in shapes your body, your nervous system, and your relationship expectations to me is a profound and very helpful way to understand where we, where, where we might struggle in relationships with ourselves and others. But I don't like this idea that, you know, people are saying, this is how I went from, let's say, anxious to secure forever and always, like I said, because I just know with every ounce of who I am that it is not possible. And why is that? Because what I just said, because you are, your entire childhood is wired from the moment you're born to read and adjust and make meaning in your body and in your relationships and with yourself over how your caregiver may or may not be responding to you. And so even if in your intellectualized brain, you know all the things you need to do, you have to hold space for the fact that you are still susceptible to being triggered. So yes, you can become more secure. Yes, you can learn to choose more secure partners. Yes, you can intentionally show up and do and say things that make you a greater source of security and stability for your partner. But if you came into that with an anxious or avoidant or disorganized history, to think that you're just gonna wake up one day and be completely healed, I think is a way to try to sell courses or books or videos or whatever. I just don't believe it's possible. I do believe you can be in a healing frame of mind, that you can, you can heal but the heal, the idea of heal means to be healing throughout your life, if that makes sense. It's like yoga. It's a practice. It's something that you do a lot and you get better at. And maybe you go from barely being able to sit on the floor to doing headstands, right? Whatever it is, or hour long, day long weekend workshops. But it's a lifelong practice. And to me, the same is true of attachment because of its intricate connection to our the story of our childhood that lives in our nervous system and in our brain around what we perceive when it comes to emotions, emotion regulation, relationships, our own needs and all of those things. So I personally think it is complete BS to believe you can just be completely healed, but I do wanna share with you what you can do to work on being in the healing process throughout your life especially if you're someone who had a more anxious attachment style. So we're gonna go through what I think those steps are. I hope you'll find this video helpful. And I just want you to know that I just, I don't want you to feel like you're failing at it because you can't just forevermore show up now secure now that you understand the concepts. And it also attachment is highly dependent upon who the other person is, what the relationship is. So you might be very secure in all of these places, the way you show up in terms of how you show up, but this person might be very triggering for your nervous system, for your attachment patterns, let's say. It could be a boss, a coworker, it could be you know a new partner, whatever. So the core, I'm going to assume in this video that you already understand there are four main attachment styles, typically called secure, anxious, or preoccupied or both, dismissive or avoidant or both, and disorganized or fearful avoidant or often both. And what we're talking about is the quality of the responsiveness of the caregiver. And when we're talking about anxious, the two main things we're talking about is number one, for the child, an over-involvement in the parent's state of mind, what's often referred to as an outside-in orientation. So the child looks to the parent to then determine they're like overreading because of the last part, which is a tendency for inconsistency or a lack of predictability. It could be the parent is emotionally unpredictable, physically unpredictable, whatever it is, but the child becomes more hyper-vigilant and hyper-focused and leaning in towards the parent to get their own needs met. That is the outside in orientation. And the research shows that a lot of these parents' anxieties and worries and fears spilled over into the child's exposure. 
So the child understands, oftentimes the parents are very fearful, they're more anxious themselves, and the child becomes really more focused on reading that outside in orientation of the parent and then adjusting the self accordingly. And that manifests in the next seven steps that I think are really important to just continuously practice and work on if you want to be in a healing frame of mind and become more secure. But I don't want you to have this like idea that there's something wrong with you because you understand all the concepts and now you're not just completely secure in every relationship. I think it's a complete setup, like I said. So number one, because of your tendency to be an outside in orientator, you are often a compulsive caretaker and or people pleaser. Basically, you are always looking to what to like, what does the other need first? And then you adjust to your own needs. But the problem is you often have to sacrifice your own development of self. You often don't know what your needs are. It helps you to numb and suppress your own pain. And it gives you a false sense of connection because it's like, look how good I am at taking care of you. But meanwhile, what about me? And so if this is you and you want to become more secure, you want to look at how often you show up really denying yourself, not asking for your own needs to be met, not knowing what they are, and making it too much about how others think and feel about you. So you really want to work on developing mutuality. Anxiousness is not about an attachment. I was so focused on you and now I'm only focusing on me to make up for that. It is about developing mutuality and reciprocity so that you understand it's a two-way street here. It's not just about you taking care of me, let's say, because taking care of me becomes you know, how we show up with a partner. Me was the parent originally, and then it becomes the partner. You know, The, parents, uh, the partners are often really proxies and stand-ins for the parents that we wish we'd had and the ones we want to heal and get right, but we often end up repeating the same behaviors and showing up the same way we did in childhood. So really focusing on developing a sense of self and honoring your own self and your own needs and maybe your own pain as a result, but really stopping that outside in focus that really makes your life about what everyone else wants and deserves and needs except for you. Number two, working on your tendency to make meaning. So because you were an outside in orientator, you learned to pay attention to nonverbal cues, sounds, breathing noises, whatever it is, triggers, and you decided that all those things in the caregiver meant something, and then you adjusted accordingly. And in fact, you're probably really good at reading other people. You can tell when someone's upset. You might be what we call, you know, which I believe is really more trauma-driven, an empath, empathic, because you've learned to rotate around everyone else, and like I said before, and then you make meaning. So to challenge yourself when you're making meaning, oh, I can tell they're mad at me, oh, that's my fault, oh, it's about me. It's like, no, what is the evidence it's about you? To pause and slow down and start to question and challenge how you make meaning for everyone else uh, around your own behaviors, how you're gonna respond. Number three, to look at your ability to start to tolerate distressing emotions. So part of what happens is we're trying to offload this, this fear, this anxiety by getting really close to you, by overreading things, by maybe protesting and trying to get you to come closer because we feel insecure in some way. And what happens is we're trying to offload those distressing emotions. It doesn't feel good inside, let's say if I met someone new and I'm dating them or a new friend, to not necessarily know how they feel yet, but that takes time. And so we have to tolerate that anxiety or the unknown. And so doing things like learning how to, you know, with classic DBT skills, I'm gonna keep talking more about this, also probably more about this on TikTok than even here, but how do I tolerate distressing emotions? How do I manage my emotions and have regulation on those triggering emotions and feelings? And how can I be more mindful about how all that's impacting my life? So it really is about your classic emotion regulation dynamics. The next one is identifying and honoring that there are these protest behaviors that you have that are really about your unmet needs in childhood, right? So in childhood, you had so much you, you wish you could have had consistency over that you're trying to get consistency in your partners today, for example. 
and yet you kind of act out in these protesting ways. You play games, you're unclear. You try to do things to, to get a read on people that reinforces that they love you, they want you, they care about you. But it's, it's really a sort of manipulation at the, core, at the core. It's not an intentional, I mean, it can be intentional, but like even if you are doing it on purpose and you know you're playing games, I would argue that the deeper thing you're trying to do is create security and stability that you didn't have. So examining those behaviors, how often do you do that? What are you doing? And to actively be more mindful and actually disengaging from those behaviors and see them for what they are and replace them with things like direct communication, asking for what you need, setting boundaries, being clear, having non-negotiables about what you will and won't accept, instead of trying to always kind of just get that, that loop back from somebody to reaffirm that, oh, they do love me, they do care about me, they do care about me, they, are, they do like me, things like that. They're not gonna leave me, whatever that is. The next one is actively becoming mindful of the people in your life who are really emotionally disengaged, who may be avoidant and who are not trying to work on their attachment style. So you're doing all this work on not being anxious, but you stay in the same relational patterns with very triggering people. What is more triggering for an anxious person than an avoidant person, right? Every time you're leaning in, they're leaning back. And so you really wanna look at trying to reward the, those in your life who show up consistently, who show up safely, and to hop out of that cycle and loop of always trying to get what you didn't get in childhood with someone who will never give it to you. The next one is honoring the value of what a beautiful caretaker you are. In fact, this is number seven. Number one was my whole thing saying, this is all BS, this idea you can just go from anxious to secure. But to honor the fact that you have these beautiful qualities that you do pay attention. You're often a very great caretaker. You can be very sensitive and very aware, and you don't wanna lose that. The problem is it's just the volume is turned so far up on that that it's depleting and exhausting and stressful for you. And so you want to work on identifying the parts of that you wanna keep, like how loving and good that is for you, but how there's a part that doesn't serve you, right? So it's about um, exploring identity and your goals about becoming more secure, about how you show up, about setting boundaries, whatever it is, like on the one hand holding how great it is that you're like this, while also holding that, you know, um, this, this being the only way of operating is actually hurting you and reinforcing and reenacting the exact same patterns of childhood. So that's it. That's my spiel on these, this idea you can just go from one to the other. I think it's a complete setup to make us feel like failures and to think that even though I can be really secure in all these places, maybe this person or this situation is really activating for me and I'm doing these old behaviors I wish I didn't. But the difference is when you're working on healing, you have the tools, you know what to do. It may not always be able to do those things, but you have a place to circle back to when you're in healing, not a place to go back and say, oh gosh, I'm never gonna be secure, you know, and then to feel bad about yourself because maybe you had a massive protest fit, maybe you were so triggered, and then you feel like, oh, I haven't made any progress or whatever. No, you have, but sometimes there's a place to just like fall off the horse and to get back up and to keep going, knowing that, you know, if you're gonna ride the horse, let's say for the rest of your life, there's a good chance you're gonna fall off sometimes when the terrain is rocky or there's a river to cross or whatever. This is like a weird random analogy, but you know what I'm saying? It's important. So anyway, thank you for being here. Please stay safe and well, and I'll see you soon. Take care, bye.